<laughs> Next speaker is um, Ida Friedberg, who's going to talk about finding bacteriosins using BOA. Yeah. This is upside down. All right. Uh, well, thanks to the organizers for being here, and thanks to all of you who have um, stayed so far. Uh, Last session, I was thinking of making some sort of joke about having only two people in the room, the tech and the next speaker, but quite a few of you, so. Okay, opening joke to dispense with. Uh, let's talk about finding bacteriosins using BOA. Um, so the motivation is basically something we are um, acutely aware of, and if not, we should be, which is antibiotic resistance. It's a big problem. Uh, bacteria are basically kicking our butts in, in uh, evolution. And uh, antibiotics are getting, um, antibiotic resistance is becoming a serious health problem uh, in the US and uh, generally across the world. It's responsible for 23,000 deaths per year in US hospitals, over 2 million illnesses. I have um, Fiona Brinkman uh, usually gives a nice example, um, not so nice, but basically she had an aunt who died of meningitis uh, in the 30s, a great aunt, sorry, and um, Fiona herself. Um, uh, actually uh, had that in the 70s as a child, but she got antibiotics and she um, survived. And then she talks about a nephew of her who had some serious health problems because of antibiotic resistance. So it's becoming, uh, antibiotic resistance is actually a health issue now. It's, it's a serious health issue and, um, and uh, uh, the pr there are various uh, problems associated with that. This needs a strong click. And you can't really see this clearly from this graph, but what happens is that actually antibiotic resistance, the time, the time window that we can have effective antibiotics is getting much shorter. So anti antibiotic deployment um, comes on, uh, is on top of the scale and the resistance observed, the color coded on the bottom, and uh, things are actually getting uh, pretty much shorter. And another problem that's associated with antibiotics is that they're getting uh, fairly more violent also towards our own microbiome. So um, even if we're not developing uh, those antibiotics, fourth and fifth generation antibiotics that are being given now uh, are so violent that they occasionally cause more problems uh, that, than they cure in terms of uh, microbiome recolonization that may not be beneficial to the host. Um, one result of, of uh, accelerating antibiotic resistance is uh, lowering in the number of drugs that are being uh, put out there by pharma because who wants to put out a drug that has a shelf life of less than a year uh, sometimes? So uh, the number of antibiotics approved is uh, going down from uh, 15 in the 80s to less, to, to less than a handful um, uh, nowadays. And I think there's only one now that's in the FDA pipeline uh, as of this at the, this day, so it's, it's kind of a, a sad story. So what can we do to um, uh, help solve this problem? Uh, well, one is, of course, use fewer antibiotics. Uh, we don't only use antibiotics in um, uh, biomedicine. Uh, actually, uh, much of the use is in, is in uh, agriculture, uh, but that does create eventually antibiotic resistance in, in humans as, as well when it's transferred to us via food or so on. Uh, use drugs that have a narrower spectrum. That's uh, another thing that we can do. And uh, hopefully ha uh, harvest more uh, natural compounds. Find a broader, uh, a broader uh, place from which to, to get them. So uh, one thing to look for, again, is to look for in nature. How do bacteria uh, fight each other uh, themselves? That was actually the first antibiotic was an antibiotic was a natural compound uh, from, from penicillin, from penicillinium, sorry, and penicillin is the product, and that was, an, that was a natural product that was discovered by Alexander Fleming. And um, actually the interesting thing is that he discovered the actual resistance before he discovered the antibiotic, and when he gave his Nobel Prize speech, he actually talked, this is going to be a problem if we don't uh, diligently use antibiotics, and he was so right. Um, so uh, antibiotics are really a, um, a metabolic product, whereas bacteriosins, which I'm going to talk about today, are a ribosomal uh, peptide product, although by the time they get so uh, post-translationally modified, you'd never recognize them for a peptide as what they are. 
Uh, nicin, the one on top, which I'll talk a little bit more today, has actually been used as a food preservative since uh, the 30s, I think. And uh, those are various other um, compounds that we can see. All are ribosomally synthesized. Uh, depending on various, uh, on their concentration, they're actually either toxins or signaling molecules. So some of them, for example, are signaling molecules that, that uh, secondarily cause toxicity. For example, though that signal molecules for creating biofilms, biofilms are compounds that are, that are um, bacterial structures, sorry, that are resistant to antibiotic by virtue of being coated with this slimy glyco thingy that stops everything from going in. So, you know, you might want to disrupt that. And, of course, they can, uh, and there are also virulence factors, so they can also affect the host. So, but we want to exploit that particular um, uh, thing. So, um, what is the, really the difference between bacteriosis and antibiotics? Uh, their synthesis is probably the, the most uh, uh, prominent thing. Uh, bacteriosins are synthesized, are ribosomally synthesized, whereas antibiotics are actually a secondary metabolite. Uh, the nice thing about bioactivity is that bacteriocins have a narrow spectrum. So if you have a good diagnosis and you have the correct uh, um, um, uh, bacteriocins, the correct drug, you can, you know, just um, uh, use that one specifically against your pathogen instead of shotgunning your entire microbiome, which creates a lot of problems. Uh, intensity of bioactivity, they, are, uh, they operate at much uh, lower uh, concentrations. Um, they are uh, susceptible to proteolytic enzyme degradability, so you, it's kind of hard to give them as oral compounds. That's a problem. Uh, thermal stability is high. That's great for using them food preservatives and um, various other modes of actions uh, are similar. I won't get into that. Um, what is your typical bacteria? Your typical bacteriosin actually sits uh, usually in an operon. An operon is a bacterial structure that gets co-transcribed, and here we have actually three of these operons. Um, this is our toxin right here. Okay, it gets produced. It's a protoxin right now. It has this leader peptide, so it doesn't kill its, its, its producer. Uh, then uh, the leader peptide gets post-essentially modified by uh, these three uh, genes products up here, NISP, NISB, and NISC. And um, then it gets transported by NIST outside of the cell. Oh, that's a post translational modification right there. Awesome. And it gets transported outside of the cell where the leader peptide gets removed, and now it's gone from protoxin to actual toxins so that it won't kill its host. We have uh, various immunity genes that are coded by I, F, E, and G. And this goes all around here. Finally, there's usually some sort of negative uh, feedback kind of um, uh, mechanism where there's a sensor outside. This is your typical bacteria to, to component system. And uh, NISK signals to an NSR, and NISR uh, can bind to uh, the promoters here and here to, to stop uh, production, to help stop production. So uh, kind of a nice, cool uh, uh, ensemble of uh, genes uh, for this whole uh, mechanism. So we want to find more bacteriosins because we want to uh, see whether we can uh, dig more, and that's, the, uh, uh, that's actually the uh, purpose of this talk. So um, just a little bit of the coding. We have here a little bit of these icons. This is the toxin. These are the modifiers. These are the regulators, and these are the immunity genes. We all have it here. So let's look for homologs in other uh, bacteria and try to fish out, which would be your normal course of action. Uh, the problem is, uh, we look for homologs of this opera and other bacteria, we kind of find that some genes are kind of missing. Uh, we can't really find a good homolog for the toxin. That's a problem. Look, at the toxin is here, but we don't find any magentas around. Uh, why not? Well, they are here. They're colored in gray and in black. The trouble is that the toxin itself is really hard to, is sometimes kind of hard to detect because the toxin gene is short. Uh, it's uh, fairly low complexity, and sometimes even gene calling, uh, uh, gene calling uh, programs uh, just, just miss it because it doesn't have your typical HMM-ish fit that a gene has. So how would you uh, actually discover them? Uh, well, you would try to uh, do the following. You try to look at the neighborhood, see, do we find regulator genes, okay? Uh, do, we find, um, do we find other context genes? And, and through that, try to discover bacteriosins on top of searching for homology, because homology does sometimes work, but not always, and try to expand that spectrum. 
So uh, to exploit this idea, we built uh, uh, BOA, which is the bacteria satan operon associator uh, program. And basically, we took a, a set of literature curated um, bacteriosins provided by our collaborators in Notre Dame, Sean Lee and Stefan Fried. And uh, we also took a database of, which contains toxins only. It's a very extensive database, but it only has toxins and not any of the context genes, as we call them. And, uh, but the literature created set also contains toxins and uh, uh, context genes. And we threw everything and blasted it versus GenBank. And uh, then, start, and then uh, partitioned our findings into uh, more homologs of uh, toxins, more homologs of uh, modifier genes, transport genes, regulators, oops, this should be an immunity, I'm sorry, uh, immunity regulators, and so on. And um, uh, from those, we clustered them using CD-HIT and build profile HMMs. So now we increased the sensitivity of our pipeline and started to look for uh, kind of more and the same over the swath of all uh, bacterial genomes, which is uh, about 3,000 and something uh, that we had in, when we looked for in GenBank uh, 2014, when uh, we first started this work. Um, finally, we, uh, once we did all that and found all the genes, we tried to look whether they are close to each other. To that, we used a simple, to that end, we used a simple click filter where we uh, modeled all the genes as nodes on a graph and looked for the connectivity uh, and looked for either a full or almost full connectivity between the genes to, to show that they are proximal. So the click filter works something like this. This would be one candidate for an operon, and we see that we have a toxin in here and a transport gene, so that probably might be a good context gene to look, uh, uh, an area to look for. Uh, here we have, um, uh, a modifier, immunity, and so on, but no toxin. Hmm, is that good or not? It's still kind of clickish, as we can see here, so it might be okay. Here we find a regulator and so on, but again, we don't find a toxin. So which, which one would be good? So uh, we need to approve the clicks, meaning which, which click is, might actually be a toxin operon, and which not. And based on literature finding, if you find a toxin gene and you find a transporter and another gene, there should be a plus here, sorry again, uh, um, that would be probably a good for approval, and you say yes. If you don't find a toxin gene, it still might be that you have a, um, uh, a toxin gene there based on the neighborhood. So we set a, very, a fairly stringent approach here, and we said you have to end all of these conditions. You have to find a uh, regulator and a, and, a, uh, and a modifier and an immunity and a transport. So in later work, we actually relaxed that a little bit, but uh, that's not the work that we published. And uh, finally, uh, this would get uh, approved. Okay, that's good. So the click filter, based on these conditions, means that this particular click, the top one, is approved. This one is not approved because it doesn't have uh, the critical mass of context genes that we need to find, and this one is approved again. All right, cool. So. Um, we compared BOA, which is our annotator, versus uh, bagel findings, and BOA found uh, many more uh, uh, genes uh, using uh, our click filter than bagel, but just remember that BOA also uses a lot of context genes, so it finds a lot of homologs. And uh, we have a classification of all the gene blocks that we found in terms of, just look at the left here because I'm kind of running out of time, uh, type of gene blocks we have, um, uh, those that have toxins undetected, those are candidate gene blocks that have uh, regulator modifiers and so on. Uh, genes, uh, gene blocks that have five functions are shown here, four functions only but including a toxin, three functions only including a toxin, and two functions only including a toxin are, are found here. So that was nice. Uh, the interesting thing is that because of our stringent uh, a very stringent uh, um, requirement to, for finding context genes, BOA without toxin genes didn't find too many blocks. BOA with toxin genes found quite a few. So homology still mostly works, but we now, well, recent research in my lab shows that if we relax the conditions for finding context-only genes, this number grows by quite a bit. So that is nice. Um, we have, like I said, we scanned the entire uh, uh, gen bank for finding bacteriosins. We find them basically in all uh, bacterial phyla. We actually have some phyla that have more, but um, 
that may be a result of um, people looking in those phyla a little bit more than in others. So that will be the firmicutes where you can find uh, streps and so on where they're of strong interest to uh, pharma. Uh, finally, the, the interesting thing is that the top three genomes that we find uh, do um, uh, come from completely, uh, the, their bacteria come from completely uh, different ecosystems. These are the top three genomes where we find the most bacteriosins, Streptococcus echi, which infects uh, the um, uh, uh, lungs of uh, horses, Streptomyces griseus, which is a soil bacteria, and Lifsonia, which is a uh, sugar cane uh, pathogen. So uh, they, they're you know, completely different ecosystem. They all produce bacteriosins. They're, they're, fairly, they're fairly interesting, and we think that there are a wide spectrum of, of indications to what they do based on that, so we're looking more into this as well. To sum up, we have uh, annotated GenBank files with all predicted bacteriosins. We need to find more curated bacteriosin blocks, so what we want to do now is to invest strongly in, in biocuration and start and do a lot of literature creation, building our set and training an actual uh, machine learning uh, way of doing these things. Um, and feed into experiments and back, which is what I'm going to do with my collaborator. Finally, uh, everything's available on GitHub. The preprint is here, and this is coming soon out in BMC Bioinformatics. I'd like to thank Jamie Morton, who was actually a collaborator in other work that was presented here. Uh, for doing this, Stefan Fried, Sean Lee, Iowa State University, my new home. If any of you are looking for a bioinformatics computational biology program, please come and consider us. We are highly competitive and very good. And if anybody wants to join my lab, this is where we're going to work. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we can just take one question because we have to keep on time because people need to get to the airport. Does anybody have a question? Okay, right, that simplifies that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>